Our gospel lesson today teaches us a lot about the Eucharist. And in, and in order to see this, first we have to start by putting everything into perspective. Jesus is mourning the death of John the Baptist that happened right before this passage. So he goes to a lonely place. In various other versions, it appears as a remote place, a deserted place, a desolate place, like a place like a desert, a wilderness, an isolated place. The word in Greek is arismo, ar arimos, which means a deserted place or a place like a desert, which is why, which is what all these different translations are trying to get at. A desert is indeed an isolated place, a lonely place, and a desolate place. So they're all they're all right. But this is also a bit of the gospel in miniature. Jesus goes into the desert. The place of death and desolation. He goes there as a result of the death of, the, of a loved one. And as he goes there, the crowds follow him. And it is there that he brings life out of death and feeds them with miraculous food. Yet the disciples do not see the importance of this. But their efforts are not without merit. They are trying to protect Jesus. The disciples, his closest friends, are trying to get Jesus some space away so that he can process the death of John the Baptist. So they tell the, Jesus to send the crowds away so that they can go get food for, on their own. In their own way, the disciples are having compassion on the crowds because they know that the crowds will not disperse until Jesus sends them away. Jesus tells the disciples, however, that they don't have to go anywhere. Give them what they want, he says. Now in John's gospel, when Jesus performs a miracle, he doesn't like what results from it because it is a shallow faith. Here in, our, here in this uh, portion in John's gospel, the crowds are simply there to see the spectacle. In fact, after he feeds the 5,000, Jesus goes back to pray. And when he has finished praying, he sees that the crowds have not left. And he waits for them to go to sleep. And while they are sleeping, he exits stage left. And he's going across the lake. And so he goes the shortest way possible by walking on the water. But this isn't John's gospel. Here in Matthew's gospel, Jesus uses this opportunity to give the people more. They are in the desert. But there is a prophecy in Isaiah that says that the desert will become a field. That is, it will transform from a place of death to a place teeming with life. And this is what Jesus accomplishes in the feeding of the 5,000. He takes what little they have and performs a miracle in the form of a superabundant meal. This is recalling the time when the people of Israel were in the desert, having been freed from slavery in Egypt, and God gives them manna from heaven to eat. This divine food is miraculous as well. It appears every morning for the people to collect during the day. And if they collect too much in an effort to put some away for an emergency, you know, just in case God forgets one day, then all that they collect more than the day's worth will have rotted by the next day. And this is the case every day of the week except Friday when they are allowed to gather enough for two days worth. And since the ne this is the day before the Sabbath and God has told them not to work on the Sabbath. In this case, the food does last for two days. And this miracle of the bread happens every single day from the first day until they finally reach the promised land 40 years later. And on that day, the day they finally step foot on over the river, it stops and has never happened again. As Christians, we're meant to see this connection between the miraculous meal in the desert and the manna in the wilderness, all in light of the Eucharist, which is subtly hidden at subtly hinted at here in the 
uh, in our text today when he used the fourfold action, the taking, blessing, blessing, breaking, and giving, as he uses in the Eucharist as well, at the Last Supper. This tie-in to the Eucharist is no accident because it connects us to the story as well. Obviously, here we are in the midst of the Eucharist as well. This is our miraculous meal meant to sustain us in our sojourn through this wilderness as we await the time in which we will enter the new promised land. This meal sustains us with what seems to be insubstantial elements, a slight bit of wafer, wafer and a sip of and now it is even less substantial because I receive the, the cup on your behalf. Yet it is the unseen aspect of this that makes it able to sustain us. Much like the loaves and the fish miraculously multiplied by Jesus, such that all who ate were filled to the point of having 12 baskets left over, filled with the broken pieces. The Eucharist is miraculously multiplied by Jesus to be able to give us all of him. And when our meal is finished, we too save the leftover pieces there in the tabernacle. When the miraculous manna came down from heaven, a single jar was kept that did not rot on the next day. And they placed this jar of manna in, into the Ark of the Covenant, and they, in the, which rested in the Holy of Holies, the innermost chamber of, chamber of the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant was to Israel a sign of the presence of God among them. And just like the Israelites, we too place a receptacle containing the leftover pieces from the feast into our tabernacle as the presence of the Lord. But we do not just leave the consecrated host in the tabernacle. We bring them to those who are not able to, to attend the feast. Now I have to go on pure conjecture here because the Bible doesn't say what happened to these 12 baskets full of the pieces from the meal in our gospel lesson today. But I'm fairly certain that they distributed these pieces to those who were not present at the feeding. Now, I don't often reference the, the 39 articles of religion or just the 39 articles for short. But these 39 articles are an attempt to define the position of the Church of England after her break with the Roman Catholic Church. In these articles, Article 28 concerns the Lord's Supper. It says the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not, or, was not Christ's ordinance, reser, uh, was not by Christ's ordinance to be reserved, carried about, lifted up or worshiped and all of this is true don't ever let me tell you it is not true the the body of christ in the eucharist was not meant solely to be placed in the tabernacle or carried about in eucharistic procession or to be put on display for public adoration all of these can be done but first and foremost the Eucharist is meant to be eaten. It is meant for the faithful to consume in order to have communion with Christ on the deepest level. As our bodies consume the body of Christ, we are made physically by the nutrients present in the body of Christ. And scant though they may be, our Lord multiplies these nutrients by his presence in them and makes them form us into what he is. So it would be silly, a silly thing indeed for us to only parade about the host and never consume them. We would be cheating ourselves of the main spiritual benefit. The same, I believe, is probably true for the leftover pieces of the loaves and fishes. Since these were parts of a meal intended to feed people and by feeding people, demonstrating the life-giving desire and the ability of God to have life spring forth from, from death, I believe Jesus had the disciples hand out the meal afterwards rather than just letting them rot in the baskets. 
so it is with the Eucharist, which though we keep as a sign of his presence among us, we do not, we do not keep at the expense of distribution and consumption for those unable to attend. So it is with the Eucharist, so it is with the loaves and the fish, though I cannot prove it from Scripture. Since Matthew ties these two things so closely together in the Eucharist and to the manna in the wilderness, I believe similar things can be said about the leftovers. In our gospel lesson today, God is providing in the midst of our sojourn in the wilderness, the land of death, which cannot, which, where it cannot be expected to encounter such, such a feast. This is what he is providing for them in the wilderness, an unexpected feast. And from what we learn from this, we find great insights into the meal that he miraculously provides us each week. We learn that this meal is not to be our sustenance, or it is to be our sustenance while we journey through this land on the way to the new promised land. And though it is a meager meal, God miraculously multiplies it such that we may feast on it as much as we will and shall be made full. And we learn that this miraculous bread is not to be put on a shelf only to be looked at as a miracle from God, but is to be engaged with in our participation of it through our consumption. And finally, as the Eucharist turns into the body of Christ, we are to, we are to use, our, use the eye as we miraculously turn into the body of Christ through our reception of the Eucharist. We are to use the eyes of Christ to see what the disciples cannot. This is a lonely place, but with the eyes of Christ we say, but they need not go away. You give them something. I told you it was a little gospel in miniature, which even comes complete.